Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome at this uh, opening event of uh, our this year's uh, master program uh, in human geography. Welcome also at this uh, first Alexander von Humboldt uh, lecture uh, in this, uh, this year's series on uh, making European spaces. Of course, at this uh, official opening event, uh, we want to give a special and warm welcome to our new master students who might uh, have um, met each other already um, in, the, um, in the framework of the first course meetings uh, the last uh, few weeks or this week, um, but who also have been um, and will be partly attending separate courses uh, in their different master specialization in urban and cultural geography, economic geography, globalization, migration and development, Europe, borders, identities and governance, um, and last but not, uh, not least, um, conflicts, territories and identities. The latter one is um, conducted in the close cooperation with the Center for International Conflict Analysis and uh, Management. There are chairs outside you can bring in. More people to come. Okay. Um, all of these uh, master specializations, they uh, share a common interest, while at the same time um, each of them also is very specific. Um, <coughs> above that, this um, <coughs> master program uh, also shares a common interest with other master programs uh, in related disciplines such as spatial planning, um, from which, for instance, uh, several students also take elective courses in our Human Geography Master Program, um, and uh, the other way around. But there are certainly also commonalities with political sciences and many others. In that sense, uh, one might say that um, one of the great features of Human Geography is uh, its inherent multidisciplinarity and its broad focus. Of course that also sometimes um, creates uh, difficulty in finding um, a theme for an opening lecture um, which fits all. In this respect we are very happy uh, and pleased that uh, Professor Stuart Eldon from the Durham University uh, is willing to come to Nijmegen and uh, talk about probably one of the most crucial and central concepts in all human geographical specializations, namely territoriality. It also fits uh, this occasion and the genuine interest of, um, of all ge geographers um, and others in this program, um, that he does not take territoriality at face value, but will show us that territoriality is a political technology, which is central in so many societal processes which make spaces. And also in many, uh, if not all, uh, conflicts which we have to deal with nowadays. Professor Stuart Eldon is not a geographer, as he told me last night, by education, um, which again stresses the very multidisciplinary uh, character of human geography. He has a Bachelor in Political and Modern History, and actually his own website doesn't say in which uh, discipline he did his master. I didn't. You didn't do it, master. <laughs> a good idea, I guess. <laughs> For all our master students. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but he did a PhD in political theory um, and he joined the Department of Geography at Durham University in 2002 and became professor there in 2007. So you can also become a professor without having a master. Um, sure, why not? Um, next to many uh, other responsibilities, he is also the editor 
uh, of one of the most distinguished and uh, high rated um, journals in our field, Society and Space. Also dubbed as Environment and Planning D. Um, society and Space, yes. Um, sorry. Um, He also has uh, been a visiting professor and scholar at many other universities, reaching from Virginia, Tasmania, Los Angeles, New York, Singapore, London, Washington, etc., etc. A list too long to mention them all. He has done a lot of um, geographical work uh, on key thinkers, Heidegger, Foucault, Lefebvre, uh, all the way up to Sloterdijk. And I even tried to persuade him to, uh, to share this all uh, with, um, uh, with us in the framework of a very intensive seminar uh, uh, related to this Alexander von Humboldt lecture. Um, but for the moment we keep that in mind for, the fu for a future occasion. Uh, while today we want to focus on what he has to tell us about the emergence of territory. Stuart Eldon, I think uh, I should stop here and um, express once again that we are very happy uh, that you are here uh, with us and I would say the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the generous introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here with you today and to talk about a project that I've been working on for a long time, a project that I'm hoping to bring to a conclusion at the end of this year, uh, but it's a project that's taken me much longer than I'd originally intended, and a project that has taken up much more time um, and has taken me in different directions to those that I'd originally intended for this project. What I'm going to talk about today, given the length of this project, the book that's resulting from the work that I've been doing, is only going to be some small moments within this much larger project, but I hope uh, will create a coherent argument about how I think that the modern notion of territory emerged in Western political thought. I want to begin with a quotation from Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, in the Discourse on the Origin and Foundation of Inequality, where he talks about a, a moment where he says, this is the moment when things changed. This was the moment that if you wanted them to go in another direction, you had to do something about it. He says, the first man who, having fenced off a plot of land, thought of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. How many crimes, wars, murders, how many miseries and horrors might the human race have been spared by the one who, upon pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch, had shouted to his fellow men, Beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget the fruits of the earth belong to all and that the earth belongs to no one. Now, Rousseau here is talking about a moment that he suggests is a, a moment when things really changed, when something that had not previously been understood in that way became the way that we maybe understand things today. That you can fence off a piece of land and claim it as your individual property, or that states can fence off, either physically or metaphorically, a part of the world and claim that it is their territory. And he's talking about particular kinds of practices that might have been done at this moment, of making the claim, of providing some kind of physical marker, some point of defence, some point of uh, keeping some people in and other people out. And what I want to try and talk to you about today is about this idea of territory, both as a practice more particularly as a concept, a way that we think about things, but also with some recognition of the word territory and the history of the word territory. It's common for people who work on territory to say that despite its importance, it's actually a neglected subject within geography, within political science, within international relations. I don't mean by that that there isn't a lot of very good work on particular territories, on a particular state, on the particular land that it owns, on the border disputes that it may have had over time, or that there isn't a lot of good work about particular territorial arrangements, Antarctica, say, or international treaties. But it seems to me that compared to other concepts that geographers work with, place, scale, landscape, network, etc. There's been much less work theoretically looking at the concept, 
to try and understand its history, to try and understand the theory of the idea. And that's really what the work that I'm doing that I'll talk to you about today is trying to think through. And the way that I try to do this is to do it historically, to think about territory historically as a concept that has not always meant the same thing, that has not always been organised in the same way, and that to take a historical approach, a long-scale approach to territory, is the best way that we can gain that kind of theoretical insight. It seems to me that when people do define the notion of territory, which tends to be a sort of a very initial stage and then they quickly go on to actually looking at concrete territorial issues and disputes, is that they seem to define it in one of two ways. One is to blur it with the notion of territoriality, that territoriality is a particular kind of human strategy, uh, is something that produces territory, therefore if we understand territoriality, we can understand territory. Or the second way is to take the fairly standard dictionary definition that territory is a bounded space, Territory is a bounded space under the control of one person or a group of people or a state. And that therefore, in Anthony Giddens' phrase, the state is a boarded power container. But these two definitions seem to me to be problematic for, for slightly different reasons. One of them is it seems that the first one doesn't really take into account history in the way that I think it needs to be taken into account. If you look at this idea of uh, human interaction with the environment that they're in, that you can tie this into the way that animals encounter the spaces or the places that they're in, this seems to be a long-standing human behaviour from very initial attempts to exclude other people from particular places uh, to uh, the ways that we think about territory today. So the historical dimension doesn't seem to me to be sufficiently worked through carefully. And the second problem with that is that scale doesn't seem to matter. A territory could be a room such as this, that you close the doors and that's a bounded space that is controlled by a particular set of procedures of how a university is regulated and, how, and so on. Up to the state, it doesn't seem to me that if we have a concept that is that broad in its range that it can go from an individual room to an area of a city, to a city, to a region, to a state, a nation, or even supranational spaces, it seems to me that the term becomes so broad that it doesn't actually become very useful. The second definition that the state uh, as the boarded power container or that a territory is simply a bounded space under the control of a group seems to me to ask the right kind of questions, but it doesn't seem to me to provide the answers in itself. It seems to me that that kind of definition would mean that we need to think much more carefully about what we mean by power, what we mean by the space, what we mean by boundaries, and so on. So neither of these kind of approaches, it seems to me, get to the kind of specificity that I think we need to if we're approaching the question of territory. The way that I try to do this, then, is to do what might be called a conceptual history or a genealogy of the notion of territory. And it takes its kind of guiding questions from a couple of works that are on different topics but seem to me to, to ask the right kinds of um, um, questions that we could use in this kind of inquiry. One of them is the work by the philosopher Edward Casey on a philosophical uh, history of the concept of place, another geographical concept. And Casey says that one of the ways that he could understand that project, what he was trying to do in that project, was to think about how the idea of place related to the idea of space. And in a sense, that's the same kind of question that I'm interested in here. If the notion of space, uh, which following people like Henri Lefebvre, is understood as something that has a history, and a history as a concept rather than a simply a history in terms of particular kinds of spatial practices, how does this relate to the way that we might understand the idea of territory? And the second one is from a geographer, uh, John Gottman, in a book on the politics of states and their geography, where he says that you can't conceive of a state, a political institution, without its spatial definition, its territory. So to think about the relation of the question of territory to the emergence of the modern state. So it's really, for me, putting these three terms, state, space and territory, into relation with each other to try to think through how that enables us to have a more, co more coherent understanding of territory. And part of the politics behind this project, which comes through in the book uh, that came out last year called Terror and Territory, uh, which is a book about the war on terror and more generally the post-Cold uh, War world, the politics of this is that I think that a historical approach to these kinds of questions enables us to understand not only how things were different in the past, but how they might be different in the future. 
It's a long-standing historical project, and as I go through, uh, you'll see how broad the historical approach takes. But it's really to try to challenge this idea that Paul Aliez here suggests, that territory always seems to be linked to possible definitions of the state, that it gives the state a physical basis which <coughs> seems to render it inevitable and eternal. It seems to me that one of the ways that we can challenge that idea and account for the things that are going on in the post-Cold War world, in the challenges that globalisation makes to the state and its territory, that having a historical understanding of how this was produced, how this emerged in the first place, may give us some insight into how things are changing or how we might want to change them in the future. The way that I do this conceptually, and I'll say just a little bit about this before I go into the, the more historical work, is to try to say that actually it seems that often when people are thinking about territory, they effectively collapse it into one of um, uh, another couple of concepts, and these are the concepts of land and terrain. The first one, it seems that po politics and uh, the political control of territory does indeed bear a relation to the way that people understand land. So land is a relation of property, uh, a community, a commodity rather, that can be bought, sold and exchanged, something that is a finite resource that can be distributed in different ways. Uh, so the political economic dimension, and I think this is certainly very important, essential to understanding territory. The second one, though, is to take the political economic and go a little bit broader with it. You can see this in some of the work uh, that Michel Foucault was trying to do, or even back to somebody like Max Weber, to try and think about the more strategic dimensions, where uh, the land is not simply a political economic commodity, but is a political strategic commodity. It's the question of terrain. It's something that is fought over. It's something that might be uh, strategically controlled to look at the power relations that are going on in these particular kind of uh, spaces and places. Territory, it seems to me, bears a strong relation to both of these concepts, but either alone or together, land and terrain are not sufficient to understand territory. If we really want to understand territory in that specific sense that I'm trying to get at, then we need to go broader than simply these two kinds of approaches. <coughs> The two things that I suggest, and these are not the only ones that are important, but these seem to me to be the most important in going beyond those political, economic, political, strategic kinds of approaches, is one is to take much more seriously the question of the law, to take into account questions of power and authority, but how they relate to questions of supremacy, majesty, superiority, and the more modern notion of sovereignty. The key question, and this is be one that I will talk about more in, in the, the latter part of today's lecture, is how the notion of a territorium, a territory, becomes an object of political rule. Not simply something that is a possession of individuals, a possession of rulers, but the very thing that defines that political rule. The second one that I think is important, and again this derives from a lot of the work that Michel Foucault and others did, is the political technical is how did particular kinds of techniques, particular kinds of practices made possible by the scientific revolution and other developments, how do these enable states to do things that they were not able to do otherwise? How does this enable them to do large-scale land surveying practices? How does this involve uh, modern cartography and the advances of state cartographic projects in terms of mapping and controlling the land, the territory that they own and control? So it's about how thinking that the, the scientific revolution, particular shifts in how we understood the makeup of the world and the kind of mathematical scientific approaches that allow us access to it and control over it, how do these relate to the emergence of the category of territory? So it's to take the political and to broaden it, not simply into the economic or the strategic, but also the legal and the technical. And this is where the, the, the suggestion that we can think of territory as a political technology, or perhaps better, a bundle of political technologies. It's how do these particular kinds of practices and the, the types of thinking, the knowledge, the sciences that underpin them, how do these make particular kinds of political uh, operations possible? So it's to try and think not simply land and terrain in themselves, but it's about what we do to that land and terrain, how we measure the land and how we control the terrain. So it's that broader sense of the political that I'm trying to get at here uh, in the work that I'm doing. As I suggested, the way that I'm actually doing this in practice is a very historical one. And this is, the, um, at the moment, the draft table of contents for this book that I've been working on uh, for about 10 years. Um, it's a book that starts with um, ancient Greece, with Greek myth, Greek tragedy, um, has long discussions of the Roman Empire, 
uh, thinking through particular kinds of ways uh, that the Romans, from going from the very small uh, city through to the, the empire as a whole, how they looked at uh, land ordering practices, the way that historians used spatial vocabulary in terms of how they wrote, how uh, going into the Middle Ages there's a fracturing of political authority, but at the same time there's a rebuilding of it in a range of different ways. And so it's really a rereading of a very expanded sense of the canon of Western political thought from the perspective of the question of territory, really asking the question, what is the relation between place and power, to use kind of relatively neutral terms just for a moment? What is the relation between place and power in these texts? And these texts, some of which are familiar and some of which are much less familiar to people who study the history of political thought, they don't seem to me to have been interrogated with this as the question in mind. So people talk about Hobbes or Locke, uh, they talk about um, the, the Greek writers, Plato and Aristotle, for instance, but they're not really interrogating it from this question. What I wanted to do was to look at these writers with these kinds of questions in mind, um, but also to bring in a whole range of, I think, un, uh, neglected people within that, that very broad-ranging uh, canon. What I'm going to do today um, is only talk about small parts of this, uh, otherwise we'll be here for some time. What I'm trying to do is to pick out three strands that I think are important in understanding the emergence of the modern notion of territory. And those strands uh, that, that I'm going to focus on are one is the legacy of Greek political thought. So not Greek political thought in itself, but how Greek political thought was reread and rethought at a particular moment in time. The second one is the rediscovery of Roman law. So again, not Roman law in itself, but how when Roman law was discovered in the late Middle Ages, this changed how people thought about the relation between politics and place. And the third one is German political practice, and I'll say more about that than either of the other two, to try to think through how uh, the Holy Roman Empire and some of the questions around the, the different powers between elements within the Holy Roman Empire led to the way that we start to think about these questions today. Now, the question of Greek political thought is an important one. You need to remember that after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century, there really were very, very few people who could read Greek within the Western uh, European world. That there were initially people like Boethius and Isidore of Seville who were making translations from the Greek thought. But when these kind of people who were the, the legacy of that classical age uh, disappeared, there were people, there were a whole range of texts in Greek that were simply not accessible to the Western European mind. And what this meant was that if you looked at works by people like Plato and Aristotle, they were known for rather different things. The classic text of Plato through the Middle Ages was the Timaeus, particularly with its myth of the foundation of the earth. The classic texts that were known of Aristotle were the texts on logic, but their political texts were simply unavailable to people working in the Western European tradition. That is until they started to do translations of them initially through the Arabic, so that the Arabic translations of the Latin were translated into, sorry, the Arabic translations of the Greek were translated into Latin, so the ideas started to come into circulation, and then later the texts were translated directly from the Greek into Latin. What this meant, and this is the availability of texts by Aristotle, such as the politics, but also the ethics and the rhetoric, was a whole new vocabulary for how to think about politics became available to people that were working and thinking in Latin. Thomas Aquinas is probably the most important of those people, making these ideas available and then trying to rethink them in the new context of the time in which he was writing. But it filters through into a whole range of people who are challenging the power of the papacy, who are trying to challenge the idea that the Pope is not simply the religious ruler of Christendom, but is also, in some sense, the temporal ruler of Christendom, the political ruler, the person who either directly themselves or through empowering the Pope, uh, sorry, empowering the emperor or kings or princes in other places, is able to exercise political power directly. So that you have this idea and this challenge to this notion known as the two swords. This is an, uh, an argument that is derived from biblical sources, but by the late Middle Ages, this has become the idea that the disciples were empowered by Christ with two swords. One of them was the sword of spiritual power, and the other one was the sword of secular power. So that you would have, through the Pope directly, power over questions like sin. Sin would be something that would not pertain simply to your life while you're on the earth, but it would pertain to whether you were damned or saved when you died. It was an eternal question, and that the Pope had jurisdiction over things like sin. 
but it was the second one that was the one that was up for question, the one that was debated. Who had power over the temporal span of people's lives on this earth, from birth until death? And the argument that was made by the papal theorists was that both swords belonged to the church, but only the sword of spiritual power should be used by the church. The other one was for the church to command, so that they would get the emperor, or they would get the king, to exercise that second sword, that second type of power, on their behalf. The classic instance where this was used was the Crusades, that you do not have the Pope sending his own armies to fight the Crusades, but you have the Pope uh, blessing the troops that are sent by the Holy Roman Empire, uh, by the, uh, the King of France, by the King of England, and so on. So that you would have a detachment between the, the exercise of the power and the uh, direction of the power. Many people thought that this uh, brought up a whole range of questions in terms of jurisdiction within particular parts of the Western European world. People that would obey some kind of spiritual relation to the Pope, how they would work things through in terms of political cases or legal cases. And this instance from the early 13th century seems to me to be a very important moment in there. The actual particular case isn't that important. It's to do with whether you should legitimate the bastard sons of a French nobleman. But the point that's important in here is how the Pope, Innocent III in this case, is talking about where his jurisdiction lays. This is a case within France. And he says, deducing from both the Old and the New Testaments, that not only in the patrimony of the church, that is the lands that the church directly controls, the lands around the Vatican City, it's not only there that we wield full power in temporal affairs, but also in other regions, we may exercise temporal jurisdiction occasionally after having examined certain cases. So in some instances, the Pope is laying claim to having a direct exercise of temporal power. But it is not that we want to prejudice the rights of anyone else or to usurp any power that is not ours. The Pope is recognising that there are limits to where his power extends in these temporal matters. And he stresses this is important in terms of the case for the French king. In his kingdom, he says, the king recognises no superior in temporal matters. So he's making a recognition that his power is not only limited in terms of what he can or cannot do, but it is also limited in terms of where it is exercised. Within the kingdom, the king, the French king, has that supremacy of temporal power. Now that seems to me important because it's a geographical determination of the particular kind of power that is exercised, that is used in those particular instances. And this case, as I suggested, a fairly minor case in terms of uh, a question about French nobility and the rights of inheritance, actually becomes an extremely important one in terms of how it gets quoted back at the papacy in subsequent cases. A hundred years on, a conflict between the French king and the new pope is around precisely these issues. It's around the jurisdictional issues within the Kingdom of France. Should the King of France be able to tax the clergy that live within the borders of France? Should the King of France be able to prosecute clergy who commit crimes within the borders of France? And this, as the, the particular instance that led to the conflict, but of course the issues go much broader than that, is to do with who exercises jurisdiction in these kinds of issues within which kinds of geographical areas. And the phrasing that gets made at this time, this is in a, a piece in support of the French king, is one that I think derives quite directly from the argument that was made by Innocent in that previous example. This is that the king, Rex in Regno, the king in his kingdom, and the emperor in the empire are functionally equivalent. That the exercise of power is something that is geographically determined, within the bounds of the French kingdom, within the bounds of the empire. And that in these areas, that the king or the emperor does not have to obey the pope directly. That in these kinds of issues, this is to do with temporal power rather than the spiritual power. It's not to do with confession. It's not to do with uh, sin. It's not to do with doctrinal issues. But it's to do with day-to-day -day politics and day-to-day -day law. That within a geographically determined area, the exercise of power rests with the emperor or the king. Now how this gets played out in practice is, is something that I won't go into today about the disputes that were had between the French king and, and the popes and how this continued over time. But it seems to me to be an important moment in terms of raising the geographical issue, the, the spatial determination of that uh, power uh, in terms of these uh, disputes between 
um, the Pope and the secular rulers within Europe. This comes through in some of the texts that were written at the time, and what's interesting about this particular case, it seems to me, is the amount of um, medieval political theory that actually derives from this particular date in 1302. On the one hand, you have John of Paris writing on behalf of the French king in a book on the power of the king and the papacy, where he's arguing that in uh, temporal matters, that is, in the exercise of day-to-day -day politics, it's only uh, possible if you have more than one person exercising that power. He says that one man is not enough to rule the entire world in temporal matters, but one man is adequate to rule in spiritual matters. It's not a challenge to the papacy as a whole, it's a challenge to how the papacy is involved in day-to-day -day politics. Spiritual power, he says, can easily exercise its sensia, which is verbal, on all persons near and far, so a distance argument. But the secular power cannot so easily apply its sword, which is manual, it's used by the hand, it's something that you need some kind of spatial proximity in order to exercise. It cannot apply it to people who are distant. It is easier to extend a word than a hand. So he's making the argument that in terms of the temporal power, the day-to-day -day politics, you can have a plurality of rulers. You can have a king of France, you can have an emperor, a king of England, and other political rulers. But in spiritual matters, the idea that you can have one person, the focus, the pope, the vicar of Christ, this would meet, seem to make sense. On the other hand, you have somebody who's writing on behalf of the papacy who's making a very different kind of argument. This is Agidas Romanus, or Giles of Rome, uh, writing on the power of the church, the power of the Roman church, saying that both the church and the faithful have lordship of a kind, but the church has universal and superior lordship, whereas the faithful have particular and inferior lordship. That the temporal must be under the spiritual, kingdoms must be under the vicar of Christ, and as a matter of right, the vicar of Christ must have dominion over temporals themselves. Agidas here is making an argument for a very hierarchical model of power, where the kind of power that is exercised by kings or emperors or princes or the free cities is subordinate to the kind of power that is exercised by the papacy. So you have here, written in the same year, both grappling with the same kind of case, but two very different models for how you can think about political power. John of Paris is clearly coming up with one that's a geographically determined one. It's to do with whether you can actually extend this use of power uh, or whether you have to... Um, uh, so put it out to a number of different people in order to be able to exercise this. Agidas Romanus is saying that you can allow these people lordship and you can even recognise that that lordship is, in, is important, but hierarchically it is the papacy that has the final say over such matters. And you have a whole range of other thinkers coming in the wake of these, again I won't say very much about them today, um, who are trying to work through these particular kinds of problems, trying to grapple with these kinds of issues. Some of these may be more familiar. Dante, of course, better known as the poet, but writing uh, the Monarchia, which is a defence of the power of the empire, but the empire apart from the notion of the papacy. Marsilius of Padua, who's writing a defence of the independent city-states in Italy. William of Ockham, who's writing um, in defence of the Franciscan vow of poverty. But this is not poverty simply in terms that the church should be poor, that the church should not have possessions, but an argument that the church should not concern itself with the material world at all, that the church should reserve its operations to the world of the spirit, the world of, um, of, of faith, and that actually you should empower people like the emperor or the kings to exercise the political power on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have a whole range of political theorists writing in the early 14th century who are making an argument for the separation of these two kinds of powers. Uh, but the key thing that seems to me to be striking, particularly in these three writers, is that they're never really quite sure what temporal power is over. They're interested in temporal power in terms of, well, it's jurisdiction over people and that you should keep the, the, uh, uh, the Pope out of this. But they're never really clear about what the actual object of temporal power is. And this seems to me to be the question, where is this exercised, what is this exercised over? And it seems that they lack the vocabulary, despite all the things that they're able to take from Aristotle and the other writers in his wake, but they seem to lack a vocabulary for what that political power is exercised over. This is why I think that the rediscovery of Roman law becomes important. And there's one particular thinker that I'm going to talk about today, Bartolus of Sassoferrato from the middle of the 14th century, who's writing around these kinds of issues. There's two key concerns in his work that seem to keep recurring again and again in the legal cases that he's focused on. One is the question of the extent of law, of jurisdiction. Where does law apply? To what does it apply? 
And the second one is the question of the relation between different polities. So it's a question about where, uh, it, what law applies in particular cases. This is what we now call the conflict of laws. But he says, if you have a person from one town who goes to another town and commits a crime <coughs> in that place, Whose law applies? Is it the law of the person or is it the law of the place? So that you have a conflict between different legal codes. Bartolo spends a great deal of time working through these kinds of issues. And he comes up with a number of useful definitions that I think are important. One of them here is about the relation of territory to the, relation, the question of property, of dominion. Dominion, he says, is something that inheres in the person of the owner, but it applies to the thing that is owned. Similarly, jurisdiction inheres in an office, and in the person who owns the office, who holds the office, but it applies to a territorium, and is thus not a quality of the territorium, but rather of the person. Now, this idea that jurisdiction applies to a territorium, that territorium is both the object of that particular kind of legal power, but is also the thing that defines its extent, inside the territorium one law, outside the territorium another law, this seems to me to be a really fundamental moment in answering that question of what this kind of secular temporal power was actually exercised over. Bartolus comes up with a number of definitions in this. He's talking about a particular case, this is one that obviously bears relation to some of the issues that are going on today in terms of jurisdiction in Iraq uh, and uh, the occupying forces and the kinds of laws that might apply in those instances. Suppose an army of one city is occupying the territorium, the territory of another, and one foreigner kills another there, may he be punished by the authorities of this city. Whose law applies in this particular instance? The law of the place or the law of the people, the individual characters that are involved in this? Now, he comes up with two definitions in trying to answer this case, which I think are really fundamental in opening up some of the issues about how we should understand the notion of territory. The first one is he says that territorium is a resumobilis, an immovable thing. Now, classical Roman law made a distinction between two kinds of property, two kinds of things, movable things and immovable things. Immovable things would be things like agricultural land, buildings on agricultural land, certain types of animals that were used in agriculture. There was a particular kind of body of property law that would apply to those things. There was another branch of property law that applied uh, to things that were movable, other types of property that might be taken from place to place where you need a different set of legal codes to deal with them. So this is one thing. He ties it, again, as he did with the notion of dominium, to a particular kind of property law. The second one, though, I think is the more interesting and the more important in terms of developing this beyond the kind of political economic argument. Territorium, he says, is so-called from terrifying, makes a reference here to the digest of Roman law, and I'll give you that quotation in a moment. So long as the army is there terrifying and dictating to that place, an offence there committed will probably be able to be punished by the authorities of the city as if it had been committed in their own territory. So it's a kind of a de facto transfer of power by the idea that you're occupying a, political, a particular place, that you're exercising a kind of a fear or a terror in that place, the transfer of power, transfer of political power comes with you. But what's interesting in this is how he's reusing that classical definition of Roman law, but in a very new context. The quotation that he's talking about there comes from the Juris Pomponius, writing at the time of Hadrian in the first, second century AD. Pomponius there says that the territorium is the sum of lands within the boundaries of a civitas, the boundaries of a city or a political community. It's so called because the magistrate of a place has within its boundaries the right of terrifying, that is, summoning or expelling. So it's a particular linkage between the Roman word, um, the Latin word, for terrifying, for exercising fear or power over people, and the relation of the place to which that power is exercised. Now, that relation between those two terms is one that you find in a number of thinkers, uh, and it's one about this kind of um, a, a broader sense than merely the political economic. It's not simply land, but it's the political power, the exercise of political power in terms of force, in terms of power, in terms of violence that seems important here. But what's important to remember when you're looking at somebody like Bartolus, who's writing in the 14th century and taking these texts from the second century, he's writing these works in a very, very different context. If you look at classical Roman law, as much as the word territorium is ever used, it's to apply to different parts within the Roman Empire, different provinces within the Roman Empire, but that they would not see that the areas outside of the Roman Empire were territorium with the same kind of rights 
as the parts of the Roman Empire themselves. So north of Hadrian's Wall or east of the Rhine River, these would not be areas that would be understood as territorium on the same standing as those that were occupied by Rome themselves. But when Bartolus is writing in the 14th century, where he's trying to grapple with the kinds of issues that are raised by independent cities within the Holy Roman Empire, he's trying to work through kind of what kinds of law applies, whose jurisdiction matters in particular places. He's starting to take the territorium to apply from anything down from a city up to a, a much larger region, to a kingdom, or indeed to the empire as a whole. He's starting to tie the notion of territorium to a polity of a range of different sizes rather than simply elements within a larger empire as it was for the classical Romans. So Bartolus, it seems to me, is very important. His successor, Bordus de Bordus, who came immediately after him, again writing about this relation between political power and territorium, but crucially this relation between jurisdiction and territorium. That seems to me to be another very important moment in uh, Western political thought. But again, this doesn't filter through into what might be called more mainstream political theory for some time. And the book goes through uh, in some detail looking at uh, Machiavelli, uh, Giovanni Botero, Jean Baudin, the other kind of classical thinkers of that early modern period, the sort of turn of the, the, the um, 15th, 16th, 17th century period, and suggesting that this vocabulary and these kinds of formulations don't really filter through in their work. Machiavelli, for instance, despite what translations may lead you to believe, does not use the word territorium and very rarely talks about a spatial determination of the kind of political power that is exercised by the prince uh, in his writings or the republic in the discourses. So I'm going to fast forward here in terms of the story to come to some thinkers who I think do pick up on these, who do reference these writers. And this is in the debates within the Holy Roman Empire, the kind of what I'm calling German political practice of jurisdictional issues about who has power in particular cases and so on. And the first of the writers that I want to focus on is Johannes Salthusius writing at the beginning of the 17th century, who's talking in a book about uh, politics, who's trying to say this is a summation of all of the writings that he's able to lay his hands on. And if you were to read uh, Althusius's Politica, you will see that he goes into a mind-numbing amount of detail, providing reference after reference to every single claim that he's making, trying to back it up with a huge amount of scholarship, both in the classical tradition, but also in the contemporary writers of his time, to try to make sure that he makes no claim that he can't substantiate by referring to 101 experts who've gone that way before him. But he does make some claims that seem to me to be an important synthesis, and the way that Althusius is then picked up by people subsequently gives some kind of sense of how important these ideas are. He's talking about a province. He says, we now turn to the province, which contains within its territory many villages, towns, outposts, and cities united under the communion and administration of one law. So it's the link between the single law, the single jurisdiction, and the territorial area to which it's confined. It is also called a region, district, diocese, or community. I identify the territory of a province as whatever is encompassed by the limits or boundaries within which its laws are exercised. It's a very specific geographical determination of an area and the link that that has to the question of jurisdiction. This is not how people were talking if you look at somebody like Baudin, if you look at Botero, if you look at Machiavelli. It seems to me to be an important moment again in the development of this idea that the, the jurisdictional issue is not about whether you're a, uh, a, a citizen of a particular place, but it's about where you are. It's a shift, people would say, from the personality of law to the territoriality of law. Athusius continues talking about a whole range of issues here. Uh, he says, even though these heads, prefects, and rectors of provinces recognize the supreme magistrate of the realm, that's the Holy Roman Emperor, as their superior, from whom their administration of power conceded, nevertheless they have rights of sovereignty in their territory and stand in the place of the supreme prince. They stand in the place means that he's delegated his powers down to them for particular kinds of instances. They prevail as much in their territory as does the emperor or supreme magistrate in the realm. So again, it's that equation of the emperor in his empire and the king in his kingdom or the prince within his principality and so on. Except for, and these are the things that are reserved to the emperor, except for superiority, preeminence, and certain other things specifically reserved to the supreme magistrate who does the constituting. 
such is the common judgment of jurists. And then he goes into a long kind of half-page list of all of the jurists who've made this kind of argument before him, including people like Bartolus and Baldus. The head of the province, therefore, has the right of superiority and regal privileges in his territory, but without prejudice to the universal jurisdiction that Supreme Prince has. This supreme and universal jurisdiction is itself the form and substantial essence of the sovereignty of the king, which the king by himself cannot abdicate. Now, there's a huge amount of things going on here. If you're interested in these kind of questions, there's a whole range of residences to earlier thinkers that he's trying to draw out here. It's an attempt to reconcile the relation between the individual rulers with, in particular, geographically circumscribed areas with the universal jurisdiction of the emperor. Althusius was a Calvinist, uh, and this is writing in the wake of the Diet of Augsburg in 1555, which had said, to whom the region, the religion, that you could delegate down the idea of the confession of the people within a particular area to the individual ruler rather than the universal ruler of the emperor or, or indeed the pope. It's the language, though, that he tries to work this through that seems to me to be important. It's not simply focusing this power within a region, within a kingdom, within an empire, but it's directly relating that power to the territorium that seems to me to be the crucial development here. So there's echoes, as I said, of Bartolus, of Baldus. There's a, a, a challenge, it seems to me, to the writing of Jean Baudin. Baudin had said that majesty and sovereignty were the same thing. I think actually here he's starting to tease these two apart and saying that while the emperor may have the supreme majesty, the actual sovereignty or the supremacy, as he calls it, over territories reserved down to the lower grade uh, rulers. The idea that the king is the emperor within his kingdom, that the power of the emperor within his empire is the same kind of power but at a smaller scale that you have if you go down to the individual kingdoms or principalities. That seems to be being stressed here. There's a division of powers. It's a more kind of federal model of how the empire might run in future. But that certain things, the kind of elevated powers of um, uh, the majesty of the emperor, these are reserved there. But the real focus of jurisdictional power is down to the individual territorial rulers and exercised within that territory. But that becomes the thing that is both the focus of their political power, but also the thing that determines their political power. Athusius then says, and this is the kind of uh, snapshot definition that you get from him, the territorium of the kingdom is the bounded and described place within which the law of the kingdom is exercised. Now, if you were to read that in a 21st century textbook of political geography, you'd think that's an unremarkable definition. But I'm trying to suggest to you that in the beginning of the 17th century, that's a very remarkable definition. It's one that's starting to put into place the modern way that we understand these relations that simply was not the way that it was being expressed by the thinkers that were coming before. And some of these links that I'm suggesting of the, uh, the temporal rulers deriving a lot of their ideas from people like Aristotle, the uh, uh, recovery of Greek political thought, but you're also finding it coming through in uh, the writers that are taking on the Roman law tradition and rediscovering that in the 14th century. And this is an attempt to deal with the kinds of issues that German political practice, the issues within the empire, are bringing forth. Now, Althusius, as I said, rages through a whole range of people to try and substantiate all of the points that he's making. But one of the people that he mentions is this writer, Andreas Knicken, uh, who wrote a book a few years before Althusius. And after that definition that I've just given you, he just basically says, look at all these very particular references, giving chapter and verse to a number of different writers, see Knicken and see the whole book. The whole book of Knicken is on this particular point. This is a book that is about the highest uh, royal or kingly privilege or, or territorial right or territorial law that he's had. Now, what I think is important uh, in Knicken's book, among, among many other things, is the way that he links the German tradition of Landeshoheit, or supremacy or power, political power over land, to this Latin notion of territorial superiority or territorial supremacy. And he brings these two quite different, distinct traditions together by saying that these terms are functionally equivalent. And he makes the distinction that I think that Althusius is making between distinguishing between the majesty that the emperor has and that the empire as a whole has, and what he calls the plurim, plurimum iuri territori, the plurality of territorial rights or territorial laws that the princes within it have. So that you have these particular kinds of laws or jurisdiction, particular kinds of exercises of political power that are multiple, but you have the overarching universal supremacy 
of the emperor. It's an attempt to try and reconcile these competing political definitions between them. This, incidentally, this relation of Landes Hoheit and superior, superiority of territory, or territorial superiority, is exactly the same equation that you find in the Treaties of Westphalia in 1648. If you look at the Latin translation, or the Latin text of that, but you look at the German translations of that, you see that the same phrase is rendered in those same ways. That, it seems to me, again, is an important moment in terms of how these ideas are not simply the works of political theorists deriving uh, speculative uh, schemes, but are actually feeding through into the kind of political practice, the political settlements of these kinds of times. Let me move uh, to one final thing <coughs> that I want to talk about here. And this is why giving this lecture here in Nijmegen is so um, uh, kind of fitting, in a sense. This is a text that was written in 1677 for the negotiations at the Treaty of Nijmegen. It was a text that was written by a political advisor for the Duke of Hanover. And he says that the question that we're struggling with here in terms of who is able to send delegates to this peace congress is the question of territorial superiority, i.e. the question of land aside, or the high right of territory. And again, it seems to me that the, you can see the link there. And calling it the high right of territory, he's making a reference back to Knicken, who was describing it in that particular way. But he says, of course, the Italians preceded them, and Baldus, the successor of Bartolus, used to say that superiority inheres in territory like mist to a swamp. You have one with the other. In this right, moreover, in addition to jurisdiction and the mild power of coercion, and he goes through a particular kind of set of arguments about this relation between jurisdiction uh, and territory, and talking about how these terms are close together but need to be carefully distinguished and how we need to work through whole range of, of the nuances here. He says that he who considers these things with care will see that territorial superiority consists in the highest right of forcing or coercing, and that this differs simply from the kind of de facto exercise of power, of the simple faculty of coercing, as does public from private in Roman law. But this right, this territorial right of territorial superiority, belongs not only to the princes of the empire, but also to the counts. For a long time there was doubt concerning the free cities, but the Peace of Munster, one of the two treaties of Westphalia, seems to have settled this. What we call territorial superiority seems to be identical to what the French call sovereignty, but in a slightly looser sense. So he's making this link between the German notion of Landeshoheit, the Latin notion of territorial superiority, and the French notion of superiority. And he's explicitly linking all of these things together. Now, this text was published under a pseudonym. Uh, the pseudonym would translate something like as the, um, the prince as an emperor. But the actual writer was Leibniz, the philosopher, somebody who, it seems to me, is greatly neglected as a political thinker. If you look at the political thinkers of the middle of the 17th century, focus tends to be on people like Thomas Hobbes, uh, John Locke, maybe Robert Filmer. But Leibniz, it seems to me, and the way that he defines these questions is actually much closer to the political practice of the time, the way that people are actually grappling with these kinds of issues. Because Leibniz makes this definition of how we should think about a notion of territory. Territory, he says, is a name common to a state or a dominion or a tract of land. But in addition to that fundamental meaning, the merely <coughs> kind of crudely geographical, it also expresses the aggregate of laws and rights so that just as inheritance and patrimony involve the whole of the things and rights in some family or dwelling, so territory signifies the whole of laws and rights which can come to obtain in an inhabited portion of the earth. He then comes, and this is in a, a French dialogue that he published around the same time, which was actually given to the delegates of the Holy Roman Empire that were coming to the Treaty of Nijmegen to discuss uh, the settlement. He says that we need to distinguish in a way that Baudin never does, between majesty and sovereignty. Majesty is the power that the emperor has. You can um, go through all of the ritual behaviours, you can show him obedience, you can show him deference and so on. Sovereignty, sovereignty is the thing that's given to you, the princes of the empire, the electors of the empire, the free cities in the empire. Sovereignty is over territory. Sovereign is the master of a territory. And in that definition, which he claims is the first real definition of sovereignty, he's making that very explicit territorial, geographical description of these terms. 
Now, he's mistaken in this claim that he's the first person to have made this argument. I think if you look at his references, and these include people like uh, the Latin jurist Baudus, uh, Bartolus, but also going back to Althusius and Knicken, these people are making much this same argument. But as a mainstream thinker, an important and influential thinker, who is advising the Duke of Hanover in terms of his political practice, Leibniz, it seems to me, is a really important thinker in terms of these kinds of relations. And in bringing these different strands that I've tried to suggest, the classical tradition in political thought, the Roman tradition in law, and the uh, grappling with the German political practice, he's bringing these things together in this text, which is why I think he's such an important political thinker who's often neglected. Let me come back to that quote that I started the lecture with today, uh, where Rousseau is talking about this particular moment, this kind of hypothetical moment, when somebody is establishing a particular set of ideas, a particular set of practices. What I think is interesting is if you read Rousseau, if you read writers that are writing around the same time as him, people like Montesquieu, people like Immanuel Kant, they're already working with this kind of assumption that political power is exercised within a discrete area that is known as a territory. There doesn't seem to be any theorization of the kind of question of territory in these works, because in a sense it's straightforward. They think within that framework. They think, I think, within the same framework that we think about these questions. Well, we can't really conceive of how we could understand these ideas without thinking that the laws of uh, England apply within the boundaries of England. But that, it seems to me, is actually quite a distinctive a trajectory that gets us to that particular kind of point. And so in a sense, when Rousseau is talking about this and he's saying, if you don't challenge this person at that particular moment, all is lost. Everything happens from that point. That's the moment you need to challenge them. Rousseau himself, though, is conceptually coming too late. And if you read the social contract, if you read the discourses, he's already working with this assumption that the kind of system that he's setting up, his social contract, will happen within the boundaries of a fixed territory, a fixed space, a fixed political area that is controlled by those people. So that this idea that he's talking about here of how you might challenge in terms of practice is something that he conceptually is unable to do at the idea of, of, of thinking, the level of thinking, because this has become an established way of thinking. But what I've tried to do today is to try and talk through how that idea emerged within Western thought, how these ideas are not something that have been timeless, and how they have a particular kind of history. Thank you.